Welcome everyone to the uh, first uh, Friday SASH session of October 2020. Uh, I'm David Kilpatrick and today we're featuring Gabe Logan, Professor of History at Northern Michigan University. Um, a, a very familiar face to uh, those of us who have been involved in SASH for the last uh, few years and um, we're really, really excited to uh, get a photographic tour of the Windy City. Um, dare I say from my Gotham-centric perspective, the second city? Is that okay, Gabe? Or Go for it, yeah. Windy City? I don't want to offend uh, you or Peter while I, on the call. Uh, but uh, they're gonna, Gabe's going to provide us a photographic tour of Windy City soccer history with images from his fantastic book, The Early Years of Chicago Soccer, 1887 to 1939. It was published uh, last year by Lexington Books. If this isn't on your shelf, you need to get it. Um, looking through the three prisms of sports studies, labor studies, immigration studies, um, to my mind, Gabe gives us uh, with this textbook, or with this book, just an amazing text, uh, a great model for, for future scholarship. Um, in some ways, uh, confirming some suspicions about U.S. soccer history, and in a lot of ways, really just blowing up um, dominant uh, conceptions of, of the history. So um, strongly encourage you to, to check out that book. There is a link up uh, so you can buy a copy um, on the ussoccerhistory.org, the SASH page. Um, it's also available on Amazon and all other um, bookstores, uh, book booksellers of note. Um, but uh, cheers to Gabe and his typical humility. Uh, didn't want to assign reading to us uh, as we're navigating uh, COVID semesters. Um, so rather than uh, giving us a, a sample chapter, uh, he thought maybe it would be fun uh, to kind of give a, a pictorial history here. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, there's some fantastic uh, images in here. Um, you'll be jealous of some of the jerseys you see in these photos, no doubt. Um, and uh, well, I'm just really looking forward to this. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Gabe, we'll hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dave, uh, and thank you, Sash, for having me and uh, helping promote the book. Uh, to begin with, it's an academic work, and so that means the price is pretty expensive. I'd recommend you buy, tell your library and put those tax dollars to work and have the library purchase it. Uh, anyway, the preface, uh, to preface this book, this work took me about 20, 23 years to, from start to end. And when I began, newspapers were not digitalized and had to be gone through either physically or through reel to reel. The Spalding guides were practically unknown, let alone digitalized. This required many trips to SIU Edwardsville. Uh, the Chicago soccer bodies were and continue to be operated on a shoestring budget that relies on volunteers to keep the leagues organized and running. Record keeping is a season to season operation with little, if any, eye toward archival preservation. So what follows took me on a research journey I little could have imagined when I began the project. Let me begin here with this title slide. In many ways, this 1906 image captures the essence of early Chicago soccer. You see the classic C on the chest of Williams. It was a regional all-star game between St. Louis and Chicago. This shows the longevity of these cities, these two cities sporting and soccer rivalry. Uh, notice that the keeper is wearing a cap dating back to a time when keepers and often entire teams distinguish themselves with caps rather than matching kits. So this image shows both past and present and past and future of the game. Uh, plus it's one of the earlier action so shots. So I got about 24 images. I want to zip through here quickly and uh, to kind of take you on a little pictorial essay from 1887 when Chicago first formally organized a football association to 1939 when they brought home their first open cup. And my slide's not advancing, I apologize. There we go. <clears throat> this slide is obviously not a picture, but many early US soccer books, this game was always often pointed to and it vexed me that I never could find this 1883 match that took place between the Wanderers and the Pullmans, predated the Chicago Football Association by three years. I finally located this small clipping in an obscure newspaper called the British American. Uh, it preceded, as I say, the CFA by three years, but it established the tradition of playing soccer in Chicago on Thanksgiving that continues to this day. 
These are two of the earliest and uh, most powerful Chicago football associations before the 1900s. On the team on your left was a mining organization from Braidwood, Illinois, about 60 miles outside of Chicago. They were early regional pioneers. Uh, give you a sense of their solidness. Golf Football Club often played them three times while playing between Chicago and St. Louis and lost all three times. Uh, this was a unique team in that they were a working class team. They were composed of miners uh, chipping the coal out of the ground down there in Braidwood. Braidwood. And uh, they were, they would often, they couldn't play in the Chicago Football Association, but they often played friendlies with the CFA. And you can see the pride in their team that they all got together for this formal shot to get dressed up. It shows their pride and camaraderie in their side. The other team was an early mainstay in Chicago soccer. It came out of the cricket clubs, uh, as did many early U.S. soccer teams. This was the Wanderers Football Club. Uh, they had the best grounds in the city because of their cricket roots. Uh, they lasted for about 25 years. What's kind of interesting there, number 13 down in front, he's holding a dog. And I saw this in so many of the early Chicago soccer pictures that either pets or children were listed as the mascots. So these were uh, the source of inspiration and children grew up learning the game and fetching balls and so forth. And so it kind of gives us a better idea of uh, what mascotting meant to these early athletics before it became littered with racial connotations. This next slide uh, is kind of interesting. Also, this, this image on the left is one of the earliest images I've ever found of Chicago soccer. There were two teams that were the, the early dynasties in Chicago. They were called the Chicago Thistles, but they also moonlighted as the Pullman Football Club. And uh, at times these players called themselves the Thistles, and I'm thinking it's because it was the only opportunity they could get away from the Pullman grounds and they could compete in the Chicago leagues. Pullman was outside Chicago by the 25, beyond 25 miles and was not allowed to compete in the city. So the workers would come together and play as the Thistles. On the other hand, when they traveled to Detroit and Canada, they called themselves Pullman. Um, this image on the left, I found it in a British auction. It's really difficult to see, but you, it says Pullman Football Club, and I think there's a date of 1896, which would have made them also the Thistles. When I contacted the purchaser that bought it, he uh, informed me I had to pay to see. And so I just liberated that copy. The Thistles were the best traveled team of Chicago. You can see up there, some of their tours included St. Louis, Detroit, Toronto, Seaforth, Berlin, Pittsburgh, Fall River. This is all before the turn of the century. On your right, you see an example of the football matches of the Chicago Football Association and some of those teams that participated. From 1898 to 1904, the Chicago Football Association went defunct. It collapsed for various reasons. Um, the cricket clubs that were able to maintain the game with friendlies, but there was no formal league. In the midst of this in 1901, uh, Charlie Kaminsky, the owner of the Chicago White Stocklings baseball team, he grew up in South Chicago and he was aware of the Wanderers. In fact, uh, Comiskey Park is the old Wanderers cricket soccer ground. That's, that's today White Sox Stadium. Um, but he envisioned, as did his counterparts on the East, of putting together a professional soccer league in Chicago. And uh, these were known as Comiskey Men, Comiskey's Men, the National Association of Football Players. They played a total of two games. They went to St. Louis and got into a fight over the gate, refused to play, got back on the train, went back to Chicago. And then they went up to Milwaukee and played the Milwaukee team and defeated them. They were next supposed to play Detroit. Detroit pulled out of the league. Uh, so they only played that one game. And uh, what's kind of interesting to me on this picture, this, this is, of course, a lot of the old Pullman Thistle players. On the upper row, far right side, Arthur Dixon, um, his ethnicity always kind of stuck out to me in this image. Never quite, quite got a handle on it. So 
Uh, anyway, it was the first attempt at professionalizing the game in Chicago. In 1905, the Chicago Football Association reformed. On the left, you see the impetus for this reformation. It was the Hyde Park Blues. Uh, they kept the game alive when the CFL collapsed and got it going again when the league reorganized. If you'll notice that trophy on the left-hand side of Hyde Park, that's the Jackson Cup. And it gives us a sense of the opulence and the money that was in that league. Um, on the right-hand side, this is one of the often overlooked stories of early United States soccer, and it still fascinates me. These are the Coal, the Coal City Maroons. And these were the sons of the Braidwood miners that relocated to the next coal field, which was Coal City, also about 60 miles uh, outside of Chicago. They were an all Illinois born team and no one could beat them. And they, the newspaper said they won with quote, disgusting regularity. And at one time the owners of the mine said, if you all can continue to win, I'll buy you new uniforms. And you can get a sense of their styling in that uniform with the buttons up and the Coal City Maroon is all interlocked in that um, in 1906, they got into a significant controversy with the league. Uh, there was an all-star game and the Coal City refused to send their players to play in it because they had a paying friendly against St. Louis. And the Chicago League saw this as an opportunity to kick them out. And they did so. Um, and they told the league, Chicago League <laughs> told Coal City to return the Spalding Cup, which you can see there at the body and bottom of Coal City. And uh, Cole City told them pretty much to go to hell, kept the cup, and continued playing in the St. Louis League. And uh, it's kind of a, an, an interesting story. When I was researching Cole City, I met this one lady whose grandfather played on this team, and they had a family tavern. And, of course, I went there and had several refreshments. And while I was there, I looked up on the shelf, and I saw this old trophy and I said, could I see that trophy? And they go, yeah, we don't even know what it is anymore. And it was the Spalding Cup. So <laughs> to the most of my knowledge, Cole City still has this cup. Um, interestingly, uh, being kicked out of the Chicago League, Cole City found a home in the St. Louis Leagues and continued to play there for many, many years. Uh, their claim to fame occurred in 1909 with the English Pilgrims Tour of the United States and Canada. And by then, the Corinthians had been here once, the Pilgrims twice. And the 1909 tour, the idea of that tour was to showcase the advantages and the skill of English soccer. And when they went to Coal City, ironically, the local Illinois boys tied them in a well-played game, 0-0. And a couple of the Coal City strikers were not in that game. They were down playing for the Ben Millers in St. Louis. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, the St. Leo's in St. Louis. After that game, American League President Ban Johnson, who was a friend of Comiskey, uh, he wanted to tour the Coal City team around the region and uh, organized a series of games with the Patterson True Blues, but those never took place. Following this group, uh, the first ethnic clubs besides the British, the Scottish, and the native born sides in Chicago soccer were the Irish. On the left-hand side, you see the Lake Shores. They had one of these remarkably storied seasons where they entered the league, won the second division, advanced to the first division, won the first division by defeating the Hyde Park Blues. Uh, their keeper in there, number five, in the upper left-hand corner, that gentleman's name was Sullivan. And when the first Pilgrim team came to Chicago and the all-Chicago side beat them in the second game two to one, a lot of it had to do with that gentleman's goalkeeping. And uh, even the Pilgrim's Diary uh, commented on Sullivan's magnificent play. On the bottom left, this was the formation of the Hibernian Club in Chicago. And <clears throat> up to this time, the Chicago Irish players tended to be from Belfast. And uh, the, the Hibs came together and said, it doesn't matter if you're from Dublin, doesn't matter if you're from Belfast. This isn't Ireland anymore. We want to put together the best team in Chicago. And let's leave our, let's leave our problems back in Europe. 
and the Hibs represented that and won the league several times uh, with a combination of former Dublin players, Belfast players, and a handful of native-born players. This next slide, uh, this is what many people consider the father of Chicago soccer, Peter Peel. He had a remarkable influence on Chicago soccer and United States soccer as well. He served twice as the USFA president. That cup there, the remarkable Peel Cup, for 61 years, it was emblematic of the best of Chicago soccer. It's three feet high. He donated that cup on the, the team there that first won it in 1909, they beat Cole City, um, were the Campbell Rovers. And this was also a native born team. Uh, they were sons of Scottish early first generation players. And you can see number 15, uh, that's Arthur Dixon's kid actually. Uh, he's holding the cup and the top half of it is off, the soccer ball and the soccer player. <clears throat> On the upper right hand corner, Mrs. Peel styling there in 1914. Uh, she presented that cup to Ben Grover, Ben Gover of the uh, Pullman team. Ben Gover was as good as they get. He was the Babe Ruth of Chicago soccer, had a remarkable career for almost 30 years uh, receiving the cup, and you can get an idea of the size of it. Um, kind of sad and another interesting mystery about early Chicago soccer. I said this lasted till 1961, 1970, 61-year run, when uh, another team called the Olympics, they were a Greek organization in the National League, won the cup, and it disappeared. And when I went to find out, you know, I interviewed several people, and no one would talk to me on the record, um, but the story goes they allegedly melted it down and sold it for scrap in order to uh, pay off some debts. And when I tried to interview the coach of that team, uh, he was no longer in Chicago and some of the organizers of the Metro League, the current league in Chicago told me, oh, that guy was nothing but trouble and he got kicked out of the United States and sent back. So uh, we're still looking for the Peter Peel Cup, and hopefully it's uh, not melted down. The Illinois Soccer Association says it's retired, and that's a polite way of saying that it's missing. By the 1910s, this team emerged as one of the top teams in the region, the Pullman Car Builders. They came out of the Pullman community. For 40 years, Pullman had a significant team in Chicago, as you can read there, they were four-time double champions winning the league and the Peel Cup. They represented of the West in the first three Open Cups, made it to the quarterfinals and the semifinalists. Uh, this picture to me uh, just speaks to me of the, the confidence and stoic uh, confidence that Pullman had at this time. This was the image taken before uh, the game before uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem Steel in 1916. It was a 0-0 tie. I've seen some records on sites that indicate Bethlehem won the game 1-0. That's not the case. It was 0-0 and Pullman had to return to Bethlehem for the second game and that ended in a 2-1 win for Bethlehem and Bethlehem ended up winning the game that year. And uh, right next to the keeper, number four, we have that gentleman in the hat, that Sheldon Gover. Uh, that's Ben Gover's brother. He became a fairly significant politician in Chicago. Ben Gover's right next to him, number six, the brothers. Um, they were two of the best players in Chicago. You get, a, you get an idea of the crowd there in the Pullman grounds. And uh, the gentleman all the way over to the left in his boiler, you know, he kind of looks like the heavy of the group, ready to crack billy clubs over people's heads. And although over to the far right, <clears throat> you have Peter Peel. Pullman lasted until about 1917 before they disorganized for a few years. <clears throat> this occurred because of World War I. Uh, there were a lot of wages. Uh, the workers could get higher wages elsewhere and Pullman refused to raise their prices. So a lot of these players packed up and they moved to Joliet, Illinois and they went to work for Joliet Steel, who was happy to take them on. 
And in addition, Joliet Steel and with these Pullman players also dipped liberally into the third generation of Coal City players. And they put together this remarkable team, the Steelmen. They won the Peel Cup several times and they were up Open Cup finalists in 1917, 1918, both times losing to Bethlehem Steel. It wasn't a close game like Pullman. Uh, Bethlehem pretty much washed them out both sides. But in Chicago, they, they were pretty good. And again, you see that classic interlocking letter and the stripes, perpendicular stripes. A few of the men have the American flag under it. It was a, kind of a, a unique image, and that's taken at the Joliet Steel Grounds. Uh, they had the, their soccer field there on the factory grounds. Chicago soccer also took off in the high schools and the colleges. <clears throat> in 1904, we have some of the earliest soccer games between Englewood and Lane Tech and Oak Park and the suburbs. Englewood was some of the early champions. You can see the evolution of the uniforms here with the, with the stripes on the sleeves. Um, Peter Peel once again donated another trophy, the Peter Peel Shield. It's now also missing. I have seen one picture of it, but I couldn't find it for this slide. Uh, but the last team to have it was here was Englewood, the high school on your upper left. Uh, the first college game that took place west of the Mississippi River was a little college, Elmhurst College outside Chicago. Uh, they played a team in Galesburg, Illinois, known as Cut Knox College. You maybe might remember that from the Lincoln-Douglas debates that took place at Knox College. The first collegiate soccer game occurred in 1906. And if you look at the Elmhurst team, the back row, you see the triangles. And this shows the relation to the YMCA. The YMCA, as I understand the story, didn't want them to have the inverted triangle with the long edge on top. And so they did a pyramid. And this showed the relationship of the school, Elmhurst College, training with the local YMCA, who was also quite big in early American soccer. Uh, as a side note, Stag uh, and the University of Chicago dabbled with early soccer, but it just never really took off for a variety of reasons. By the 1900s, we see the rise of the ethnic clubs. <clears throat> These organizations arrived full force in Chicago at this time. Everybody in the city, every other person in the city was from somewhere else. And the ethnic clubs wanted to play soccer. They had been maturing for about 30 years in their home countries. They came to Chicago once they were able to get a modicum of economic stability. They organized teams, but they didn't want to play with the British and the Americans for various animosity reasons. And so they formed the International Soccer League in 1919. It still continues today as one of the longest serving leagues in the United States. At one time, the ISL had over 80 enrolled clubs. Um, and as you can see on the upper right, lodges eventually saw the power of the ISL and even British teams were jumping to take place to play in the ISL. Uh, if there was a European side, they were represented in this league, except the Finns. I've never found a Finnish team in Chicago. But there were Germans and Nordics. They were the first teams. And then they were followed by uh, the Eastern Europeans and the Polskis. A uh, couple of interesting images here in the upper left. That's the Rangers, another All-American team. Uh, this came out of John Knut's file. His ancestor played for this team as well as the World War I team uh, that uh, our colleague Brian Bunk did some work on that played over in Europe. This is when he was playing with Chicago. And you can get a sense of that team in the upper left. And they also took a studio picture down in the lower left. And it's the same team. Again, I think this speaks volumes that they would sit for a formal picture. They're holding the Garger Cup, which was the lead, which was the main trophy in that league, um, to go out and get a formal image. On the right-hand side is an early picture of Sparta. 
I have never seen a uniform like this. You got perpendicular stripes, you got a horizontal stripe, and you have the Sparta S in there. Um, it's just, it's just so unique. I don't know, maybe if someone ever sees something like that, it's kind of like the 1950s United States National and even our sash jersey, but I've never seen it coupled with the stripes and, and then the big letter in the center. A couple of other teams that demonstrate the longevity of the International Soccer League, these played in the late 30s. You see, you see the Italian League on the left, an Italian team on the left, the Maroons. By then, they're sponsored by the local restaurants that were helping out during the uh, Great Depression. And on the right, you see one of the many fine Jewish teams in Chicago. Uh, again, you get a sense of the pride of the people dressing up to make sure they're part of this image. One surprise of early Chicago soccer were the Lady Booters. Um, this was a difficult story to excavate. Uh, Chicago soccer had one of the finest park systems in the United States. They were part of the playground movements, especially down in the south side and again Pullman. And women were encouraged to play soccer as, as young girls alongside their separate league, but at the same time as the boys. Um, but by the time they'd reached high school, there was no more organized soccer for the girls to play. And as they entered into uh, their 20s, many of these women wanted to continue playing. And so about from 1919 through about 1923, there were four women's teams that played. These are two of the only images I found. Once again, you see Sparta, uh, part, part of the uh, strong body, strong mind, strong spirit concept of the YMCA. They put together a women's team that also played in Western Electric Factory. And on the right, again, the ubiquity of Pullman. Uh, these were Pullman Technical School graduates after high school. They were another team. Uh, there were the women's service workers of the transportation unit that also had a team. And then, as I said, uh, Western Electric. About by the mid 20s, they pretty much went away and there was no more women's soccer for about another 30, 40 years that I was able to find. Probably one of the highlights of the ethnic leagues was in 1924, uh, one of the powerhouse teams, the Swedish American Athletic Association in the inaugural amateur cup in Chicago. The Swedes made it all the way to the championship where they faced uh, Fleischer Yarn out of Philadelphia. Uh, here you see the game, it's taking place in, DePa in DePaul Field down in the city. Uh, the Swedes are in the perpendicular stripes. They were runners up, the Philadelphia team won that game. And what was kind of interesting about this, this was to be the team that represented the United States in the 1924 Olympics. And so the winner of this amateur cup would go on to Paris and, uh, or wherever the 24 games were, um, and represent the United States. And a lot of the Philadelphia players ran into uh, naturalization issues. And so they were only able to afford, I think eight made that trip. And the rest were to be made up of the Chicago players, but they too ran into issues. And so only two of the Chicago players made it. And then the rest were extrapolated from various leagues around, uh, from around the United States. Um, the Swedes uh, made it to the semifinals the following year, Amateur Cup in 1925, where they bowed out to eventual champions, the Toledo Club. Um, but, but this is interesting as professional soccer was taking off in Chicago, the Swedes made a conscientious decision to remain amateur and became one of the better sides in the city. <clears throat> the Olympia team, not the Olympia team that burned the cup down, and <laughs> melted the cup down, but an earlier Olympic team. This is currently one of my favorite images uh, in Chicago, early Chicago soccer. The gentleman in the upper right, in the right hand, uh, in the back row standing, he's four, to the right of the goalkeeper, and he's wearing a tie. 
That's Anton Cermak, and he was the mayor of Chicago. He was known as the immigrant mayor. Uh, he was born in Czechoslovakia, but moved to the United States when he was one year old with his family. He grew up in Braidwood, Illinois, and undoubtedly watched the Braidwood miners and recognized the amount of people um, that came to watch soccer. And Cermak is often seen as uh, the way he was able to put together his political machine was the ethnic vote. And most historians have said it was because of his stance on liquor, which undoubtedly helped him. He was a wet. Um, but I argue in the book and elsewhere that it was his involvement with soccer. And this was his team, the Olympia team. Olympia team. It was out of the Czech neighborhood, but they were all native-born native born boys. And uh, they, they were a hard-nosed, remarkable team. This, this image in itself, notice the manhole cover down on the bottom. No one's smiling. You got bars on the window in the clubhouse. All the way to the right-hand side, you got that one dude in the suit. Uh, you know, it, it just screams ethnic power and mafioso control and solidarity. Um, what I always like about this unsmiling group of players, <clears throat> you're all familiar with the Ben Millers that captured the 1920 Open Cup, and it's often lauded as they were the first native-born team to do so. On their way to their championship game, they had to go through the Olympias. They had to play Olympia. And th this was a three game series and it was split and went into several overtimes before Ben Miller finally won. And it was 22 players all born in the Midwest scrapping it out to go to the Open Cup. And uh, I think it speaks to a lot of the animosity and competition between St. Louis and Chicago. Uh, two of the St. Louis Ben Miller players were allegedly kidnapped and people thought that supporters of Olympia did that. There were guns drawn at these games. Cops would show up. There would be riots. Turns out the two Ben Miller players were reconnecting with friends and were in fact drunk at a hotel. Um, but I think it speaks to this, again, this rivalry that people took that seriously that a team would have kidnapped them. Um, but anyway, that's Sermak's ground. That's his team. Sermak would be the Chicago mayor until he was with FDR in the 1930s uh, when FDR was campaigning for his for president and uh, some guy tried to assassinate FDR in Florida and shot Sermak and so he was killed and but his soccer heritage lives on today as the mayor's cup. Also in the 1920s, the first Chicago team to make it to the Open Cup were the Chicago Canadian Club. Very difficult to find any information on this team. Um, this was a watered down affair. In the 1924-25 season, the St. Louis Leagues and the American Soccer League weren't putting any teams up because they were having falling outs with the USFA on, uh, on splitting the gates and playing in the off season. And so they had their own soccer championship and drew 10,000 people to St. Louis. Well, in the meantime, the, U, the Open Cup went on and Chicago's Canadian club, which was a bunch of British expats and a couple of local boys, mostly British expats that had come here by way of Canada, um, ended up winning the Western and they played the Shawshine Indians out of Massachusetts. Shawshine won the game 3-0 and the Canadians came back. They uh, immediately found a sponsorship with the Chicago's Carpenter Unions, and uh, they would play for the Carpenters Union for several more years beyond this. This is the only image I've ever been able to find of the Canadian club. It's the, it's the semifinal game against the Cleveland Thistles, and I'm still not sure who's who on this. In the 1920s, between 1926 and 1929, over 18 international, friend, 18 international friendlies occurred in Chicago. And uh, the Chicago sides earned a respectable 9-7-2 record. My account of attendance records 
showed that there were over 158,000 fans that clicked through the turnstiles for these 18 matches. And this is just one of many images of foreign teams that uh, inundated United States soccer. It's of course in the iconic Soldier Field. Back in its day, this game drew 30,000 fans. It was a three game series between Sparta Prague and uh, they played Sparta Chicago, they played Chicago Bricklayers, and they played the Chicago All-Stars. This was the All-Star game. Um, the All-Stars of Chicago lost 1-0, but I think it kind of captures uh, uh, this, what, what sort of is left of Chicago's Soldiers Field, how it looked in its heyday, and that a fairly sizable crowd is out there to see the game. The famous team of the 1920s, of course, would be the Chicago Bricklayers. They were another union team. Uh, it was a backlash against paternalistic industrial sponsored sides. Uh, the soccer players found sponsorship with the local unions. The Bricklayers were Local 21, one of the oldest union teams in the United States. This was an all-star aggregate of local boys, mostly out of the Pullman area and international Scots that had come to Chicago. Um, they were one of the winning sides in, in Chicago history. One of their highlights included when the Uruguayan Olympic team toured the United States, the bricklayers beat them also in Soldier Field. They were in the Open Cup Finals uh, up there in the upper right. You see them before the 1928 game, uh, they made it, they ended up playing the New York national side. They tied them 0-0 in Chicago for 16,000. And then they had to go to New York where the New York team took them down 3-1. And then was their second final in 1931. Uh, they, they played the Fall River Marksman. This is the game in Chicago's Mills Stadium. Um, the New York team, they were the Fall River team and halfway through the season, they moved to New York. So Fall River Marksman, also known as the New York Yankees, um, they came to Chicago. The great Burt Patania, how did Burt Padna, uh, he lit it up. He scored like, they couldn't shut him down. He scored five or six goals against the Bricklayers. And um, then they went back to New York and lost 1-0 if they were able to shut him down that game. And then they played a third game and uh, New York slash Fall River beat them for that. That was the highlight of the bricklayers, uh, but it shows this wedding of industrial union, not industrial, but union sponsorship and early Chicago soccer. During the Great Depression, uh, Chicago soccer, along with the rest of the nation, had to operate on a shoestring budget. And you can see this in some of the sponsors of this day. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you have the Weebolt Wonderbolts, fantastic name. Weebolt was a department store, and department stores were able to survive and, in fact, thrive during the Great Depression. And a lot of uh, Midwest soccer teams took on this sponsorship and tapped them for money. Webolt were the old bricklayers and found money working for Webolt and having them put in money for them. Uh, you're probably more familiar with the famous Sticks Bar and Fuller team out of St. Louis. That of course was a department store in St. Louis. The Sticks found uh, sponsorship there. Prohibition of course went uh, by the wayside and a lot of early soccer at this time found sponsorship in the breweries. Chicago was not immune to this. Uh, Central Brewers in St. Louis won several open, won an open cup. In Chicago, Sparta was sponsored by the Garden City Brewers. There was the Manhattan Brewers. The Pabst Milwaukee team played in the team. They were sponsored by the Brewers. And uh, another paper and kind of a fun little side note of United States soccer I found is in the upper left-hand corner. The Communist Party of the United States also reached its highest point, high water mark of membership, and they saw sport being open to all the workers and not just to the elite craft or craft unions or corporate paternalisms or colleges. And so they created their own soccer league. And there you see the Chicago team, you know, it's the Red Stars 
uh, quite prominently emblazed upon their jersey. From 1928 to 29, Sparta emerged as one of the best teams in Chicago. They equaled the great Pullman team. They captured the Peel Cup seven times. They won the league champion night championship 1928 and from 1930 through 1936 captured the league championship. In 1938, they became the first Chicago team to capture the Open Cup. You can see it there proudly in front of them. Um, this team, it, it didn't have a lot of Chicago native born players. It had two, the two goalkeepers. However, a good chunk of these kids came to Chicago in their youth. Uh, between, you know, the, the century of immigration shut down in 1920. And so these kids were here four or five years old. So they were growing up in the Czech neighborhoods of Chicago and learning their, learning their soccer in Chicago. Um, but the Sparta team was, put, was financed by the Czech community. And they also opened up a, a, a I don't want to call it an underground railroad, but they had a connection um, to the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia is known as that time. And they brought over several players that played for Czechoslovakia in the first World Cups and the Olympics. And they're also on that team as well are a couple of players that uh, had professional sp experience in England with, Man with uh, Manchester. <clears throat> so Sparta was the first team to bring the cup home to Chicago, uh, 1938. And then they won it again and they were co-champions in 1940. In between Sparta's dynastic run, there was another Chicago soccer team that had a, has a rather remarkable story behind it. And that was the Manhattan Brewers. <clears throat> and Manhattan Brewery was this gangster brewery that Al Capone owned back in the 1920s. And well, it started with Natty, uh, with, with Capone. Capone gave it to Natty, and then it went down to Capone's bookkeeper. And uh, when prohibition was repealed, Manhattan was about to go into the dust bins of United States breweries, but the mob took over the bartenders union in Chicago and pretty much threatened the union. If you don't sell Manhattan beer, you're going to end up dead. And the union complied and Manhattan brewery, Manhattan beer became the top selling beer in Chicago. And in an effort to clean up their image, they put all this money into sport. And then they said, hey, let's put together a soccer team. And so for one season, they bought out the Jewish team in Chicago, the Maccabees, and they brought in their players and they cherry picked some of the best players from the defunct American Soccer League in the East. They enticed all these players, including Billy Gonzalez and Alec Robb to come out of St. Louis to play in Chicago. And they had a remarkable run. And they knocked off Sparta. They knocked off the Detroit Holly Carburetors. They knocked off the Ben Mill, the uh, Sticks Bar and Fuller team. Uh, knocked off Pittsburgh. And <clears throat> you get a sense of the money that was involved there and how they were taking Pullman specials. They're dressed up, looking pretty sharp for the tail end of the Depression. Uh, of course, Billy Gonzalez and his mentor, Alec McNabb, had had their falling out at that point. So McNabb stayed in St. Louis. Uh, Gonzalez came here and played that one season. And they usually won every series by coming from behind. Uh, here's a couple of publicity photos. <clears throat> you can see the Manhattan beer bottle embossed on the arm of the player. Of course, you have uh, uh, Salcedo down there on the left who was a rather remarkable player in the New York leagues. He was brought to Chicago where he kind of tripled his salary working for Manhattan and playing for the team. Uh, you have big Huey Davidson, an old bricklayer who was in the back. Uh, they made it all the way to the Open Cup Finals uh, before they ended up losing to the New York Nationals. And then the next year, Sparta came back, 
when the Manhattans came back to Chicago because they didn't want win everything. Uh, seemingly, the mafia pulled their money out and said, on your way, thank you very much, we had a good run. And they went back into wherever they came from. <laughs> Last but not least, um, this image is also one of my favorite images. Uh, this is the last image in the late of the Depression. Uh, Chicago soccer was able to convince several of the newspapers to organize a soccer tournament. And one of the surprise teams there is in a perpendicular stripe. Um, outside of Chicago, there's an orphanage known as Moose Heart, and it's the loyal order of the Moose. And these were children of the moose whose parents had died and it was a benevolent society. It was known as the child city of Chicago. And Mooseheart was able to lure this British coach. And he said, well, we don't have anything to do. We can play soccer all day. And he put together this team, entered them in the tournament and they started winning and they started winning and they ended up playing Milwaukee in the final and uh, they won, this is the championship game. And I, I always like that image. I think it kind of captures where Chicago soccer was in the 1930, the roughness of the field, uh, the, the grittiness of the image. And I was able to interview this gentleman by the name of Bill Stanley, who was on that team. He was the last surviving member. And as I was talking to him, he was telling me, I go, yeah, I found this wonderful image of one of your uh, teammates dribbling and Bill Stanley said oh that's me in the image uh, the newspapers misidentified me and I, I kind of looked at some other moose heart pictures and that seems to hold up uh, Mr. Stanley has since passed away but I, I think that's kind of nice to be able to give him the recognition that he had uh, some 60 70 years later and so that's my very brief presentation well, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Gabe, thank you very much. And uh, a very heartwarming uh, story at the end there, how uh, sometimes uh, taking a very scholarly approach to a subject can still have such a, a tremendous impact on the most personal level in, in ways we can't even imagine. Uh, that That is so cool. Um, I've got 101 questions myself. Um, but uh, how about uh, everyone else? Uh, please, by all means, queue up. Uh, no one is in the queue right now with the first question. So go ahead, uh, raise your hand, jump in. Anyone who has any questions or comments, please. Hey, Gabe, this is Tom. Uh, thanks so much uh, for, for joining us. I remember, I believe it was on Chicago, the working class, Elizabeth Cohen. And she was so well known. And, and I think point of pride that her captions to photographs told these mini histories. Um, and I think you've done that for us. So uh, just wanna thank you for kind of showing us the way, you know, that, that pictures can tell multiple stories uh, speak the themes and, and you really dug that out for us. So I, I, I want to say that's what I enjoyed uh, the most, you know, having read, you know, a, a man, you know, your manuscript and then, you know, in possession of the book right now, I, I think this was just excellent for our society and, and, and shows us how we can engage photographs uh, in that. So my question would be, um, you know, unearthing these photographs, you know, writing the narrative, you, you've obviously done a great job, you know, blending the two. So would you just like to, to comment on that as, as uh, a historian? Yeah, uh, <laughs> this kind of, I suppose this is with any book, but now that the book's out there, now all these artifacts are flowing to me. And it kind of took this book to get out to the public and all of a sudden this memorabilia people are saying oh my great grandfather played and I have these medals I have this trophy I have these images and uh, of course that's the sad part that I can't reinvent the book um, but I think that shows a path in the forward that when this starts to get public as we're all doing now these stories are starting to come out of the attics and uh, this personal touch that's often associated with the images. 
And uh, again, our colleague Brian found that out speaking to uh, Knut's ancestor about his uh, relative that played quite heavily in Chicago and made it all the way to World War I and had these wonderful images. Um, so to speak to your question, Tom, there's just a picture tells a thousand words and here we see it. Rachel, uh, you're next up in the queue, please. please. Hi, thank you, Gabe. I absolutely loved um, listening to this and learning so much. Um, I, when you talked about the Lady Booters, it made me think of, um, there was an English team, a women's team around the early 20s. Um, I think it was Dick Kerr's the Dick ladies. Kerr's ladies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they had an American tour, but I, if I'm correct, they played men's teams. And so I was wondering if they played around Chicago, if there were any teams um, that you know of that they played, if you found any photos, and if they played any of the women's teams. Yeah, the Dick Kerr ladies were scheduled to come to Chicago. And I think they made it to Toronto and there was a falling out over the gate on how much they would get paid. And uh, the Dick Kerr ladies, they were underfunded and the majority of it was going, they were going to play a Chicago men's team. And they said, no, we can't do that. It's cost prohibitive. And so they turned around from somewhere in the Northeast and went back and continued playing ASL teams. Uh, yeah, it's one of those instances, what could have been. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Someone else? Um, Gabe, I'd like to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, number one, the, this is extraordinary work. I want to thank you very much. Uh, I very much look forward to, to reading the book. I lived in the Chicago land in the early 1990s and um, am fascinated to uh, hear a little bit more about this backstory. But my question for you really relates to, um, in the research that you did for the extraordinary number of years you've been working on this book, did you ever encounter any, or what did you encounter about the involvement of Mexican American or Hispanic leagues and, and, and soccer in, in that age? Because I know that now, if I'm not mistaken, a quarter to a third of the population in the Chicagoland area is, uh, is Hispanic um, in origin. Did you run into a lot of that? Because I, I struggle to find that here in Texas um, because so much of that is is virtually underground in a lot of cases. Yeah, um, yeah, it is interesting. It's a, it's an un, it's a under researched story. Uh, the first soccer Mexican soccer team in Chicago took their name Nacaxa, and that's of course a famous uh, first division team in Mexico. But they're also known as the Electros. And they were the electrical union working team in Mexico. So I wondered, well, what was the connection of that in Chicago? Their first league, they were in the Communist League. So the first Mexican team in Chicago, Nacaxa, played in this Communist League. And then when the Communist League folded in 1934, Nacaxa stayed and joined the International, the, the international League. And uh, they moved into an old German socialist hall. And the Cox, uh, I think, is still around in Chicago. And it, as you pointed out, it ballooned into one of the largest soccer playing populations in the city. And I recently did an interview with uh, this gentleman out of CONCACAF. Don Nacho, the legendary coach of Mexico, was 103 and just passed away this year. And for three years, he played in Chicago. It was beyond the scope of my study, but he played with the Chicago Vikings. And I was able to find a couple of pictures of him uh, when the Vikings were in that semi-professional league. And the Vikings had extrapolated him from the Mexican leagues in Chicago. Um, so they're, they're just at the tail end of my research. And they were part of the Communist League, which was at best underdocumented. And it wouldn't be until the 1940s that the Mexican leagues would begin to take on a life of their own. And I think even by the 1950s, they were some of the first soccer teams in Chicago that uh, were on TV, uh, the indoor games. So uh, yeah, it's a fascinating story. Um, also in my research, it's in one of the last champ chapters, there was the Pan-American games down in Dallas. And uh, 
there was uh, a Canadian team, the United States team, and a Mexican team. And there was a Tex-Mex all-star team that also played in that. And uh, it was one of the largest crowds of those Pan American games down in Dallas. So that might be something to look into with your research. Um, actually, in fact, uh, it, you've stole a little bit of my thunder because my we're doing a presentation in early December um, that uh, that is being organized, and one of the one of the parts of the presentation is actually going to talk about those games. Looking forward to it. That's under researched area. Thanks for shining a light on it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I just want to add to the the epilogue goes beyond 1939 into uh, the more uh, slippery slope of, uh, you know, the past 50 years and the formation in 1973 of the Hispano League and its uh, reasons for not necessarily integrating or assimilating into uh, um, the Chicago soccer well-established hegemonic forces by then. Um, Gabe does go into that as well, that more recent history in the epilogue. Thank you, Dave. I forgot about that. <laughs> we, we need What I guess they would call it unsanctioned, I think is a better word, across time. I mean, I stumbled uh, at a local field, you know, full setup, you know, referee, you know, professional uniforms, you know, vendors, and it was in one of these unsanctioned outlaw leagues. And, and they had, you know, people taking photographs and families were there. So there is a whole scene. That, yeah. that is in many cities that uh, probably have long histories uh, that could be in private collections. Kevin, are you, uh, you up next? Uh, if, I, if I can pick up on the communist bit that you just mentioned, Gabe, um, that was really interesting. I, I, mean, I read some of the stuff that you did on, on the um, communist soccer earlier, but I was wondering, because um, you, you mentioned that there's a link between the uh, you know the uh, there's this affiliation with the Red Sport um, international movement in Moscow in the 1920s, and and you talk about the labor sport union and how it you know it, it you know it condemns the you know the the IOC the IOCs um, you know the way that they deal with with the Soviet Union in the, in the at the end of the 20s and and, and the whole question of the 32 games. Um, I wanted I was but you, there, it's all kind of focused on the communist groups in Chicago and, and nationally. And there's and something, I mean, probably it's not something that necessarily you, you were looking to pull out, but I was curious, because I, since I saw that you went through the Communist Party um, archives, um, which is yeah. amazing. And I'm so curious to know what else there was, if there is anything at all, that shows a, a, a link between national communist stuff based on soccer, huh? with international movements because you know in 1927 there's the the international communist uh olympics the spartia games Spartacad, yeah um and and i'm just curious you know because this is all happening contemporaneously and i'm just wondering is there any connection between these groups in chicago and wider international workers movements um or not because because since there's so much movement the international teams that come you know the the teams that come from central europe there's all this transnational movement, but is there anything that, that documents more the, the, links, uh, the links between that? I'm just curious on that. Yeah, that, that, that was a fun slice of research. Uh, where I live here in the Upper Peninsula, it had one of the largest Communist Party memberships in the United States. And uh, my wife's grandmother was head of the Communist Party in the UP. And so it kind of started finding out all these hidden histories of the red fins. Um, and I stumbled upon those records for a brief five years the, when the communists, when I think Yelston was in power, he opened up the records. And there was a lot of people from my region that had, had migrated to the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And so I was reading these letters and those documents and you were correct to answer your question in a roundabout way. Um, this was the United States answer to hold a Spartaca in the United States. And Chicago was chosen because that was the birthplace of the United States Communist Party. And the Haymarket Square was the original May Day and all that. And the idea was to have a Workers' Olympics. 
and people came from the industrial cities of the United States and the Upper Peninsula to be part of these worker Olympics and soccer was kind of the highlight game of these worker Olympics that the New York Red Stars uh, won over Chicago in Inglewood. Um, so yeah, there was very much a connection there. And uh, the, they tried to bring over the Soviet Union soccer team and uh, the State Department said, no, no, they, they cannot come and threw, threw it away in the trash. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> wow. So, and, and so you came across also migration going the other direction in the in the yeah. Third. Yeah, there's a region in the Soviet Union called Karelia, and it's next to Finland, and the Upper Peninsula's largest immigrant group were Finns. And during the Great Depression, they couldn't get a job, there was no money, and the Soviet Union was saying, come build the worker's paradise. And so about, I think, 20 to 30,000 people from the Lake Superior Basin migrated to the Soviet Union and settled up Karelia. And uh, there's an argument that Gorbachev, uh, his teachings came from a guy out of Karelia, and he had this fascination with Canadian and United States culture and was very much aware of it than other leaders because of that immigration. Um, but then, of course, Stalin came into power in the Finnish-American War, and, you know, Stalin in his madness began killing everybody. Um, but there were quite a few Michiganders that ended up making a life over there and remained in contact via the mail and sometimes travel to their relatives here in the Upper Peninsula, including well, my wife. Very people. much. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a weird I, I, I think those four pages are the most fascinating of the whole book. It, like the ones that just blow my mind. You're like, what? Yeah. Where, where Gabe explores the, exactly those connections at the organizational um, level, right? Where there's even kind of like a Soviet guidance to what's happening, right? Um, stuff like that. It, just the idea of a, of a football club named after Fichte just blows my mind. I, um, yeah. there's, it's a really fascinating packed four pages. Uh, towards the end of the book that explores that whole communist soccer scene. It's really wild. Dick is alive and well and still kicking in Chicago today. They're, they're part of the German groups and uh, solid team. Dick and Rams. Someone else? Gabe, um, I'd like to ask you just, to, well, again, I, I could ask uh, and ask and ask and ask. You know me, I can't shut up, but... Um, the fact that you actually kick off the book with, you know, a Scotch professor, right? Um, you, you open up uh, talking about um, Andrew Barr, you know, oh, this right. immigrant uh, from uh, Kilwinning. Um, and I find it really fascinating the way in which, you know, again, obviously the thistles being that early, early powerhouse. Um, and, you know, you talk then about, you know, the, the role of the cricket clubs initially, which is, again, another pattern a lot of us have been really kind of obsessing over the last few years. Um, but but I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the negotiation of, say, uh, Scottishness, uh, Britishness, uh, even Irishness. Um, you talked about the Hibs kind of setting aside some things. And again, it, I'm really curious about that, say, like the Belfast population that would have been involved in that. Hibernian in Edinburgh, of course, precedes Celtic uh, in terms of serving a very specific mission for a very specific community. So if it served the very flip of that in Chicago with the very same club name, that would be really fascinating to me. Um, but also the way in which you at times negotiate Scottishness and um, Englishness. And then a little later on, you even touch on uh, Scots Irish or Ulster identity, um, and in a major thrust of the whole book, um, again one of the things I think is absolutely so essential about this book is the way in which you keep talking about uh, sport as yeah okay it um, reinforces or preserves some ethnic identity, but then it also is giving way and there's all these native-born players. I mean you make a really great argument for the you know, again, for lack of a better term, the native born American player and their, in, in other words, you know, that um, there's a lot of that going on. It's not just an immigrant game. Again, until oddly enough, really, it seems like in 1973, things really break down. 
Um, I know that, again, that's beyond the initial purview, but you do talk about that in the epilogue. So I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, the whole notion of ethnic identities, uh, salad bowl, melting pot notions of Americana, um, and the way in which Chicago may complicate this in different ways, right? Um, and again, just to, to really drive this home, right, this, the notion of a club, whether it's supposed to be representing a community or just trying to win trophies or even try to, to make money or promote the sport, right? Um, clearly, there's still a need for AYSO to come into Chicago. And as you say uh, later in the book, there's more AYSO players than any other youth group there. So I'm just wondering if you could kind of tease that out a little bit for us in terms of yeah. that thread that runs uh, throughout the So these players are coming over and they're having their homeland's style of play ingrained in them. And that's what they're bringing to Chicago. Uh, but all of a sudden, they don't have an entire community or let alone a nation to play with. And so they start kicking with all these other different styles. So in some of the early teams, you have people coming from Germany, you have people from Scotland, you have people from England, and they start kicking together, but they're also running into the playground movement and American football. And you have these brutal conditioned fields with center rock grounds and tackling and the St. Louis style. And it's all, as you said, at this salad bowl of these amalgamation of playing styles. And it becomes, I think it's a combination of this elegant passing, controlled soccer game, and this rough and tumble long ball game that's taking place in St. Louis of run and gun. And to me, it came together in Chicago. And so while there's these uh, elements of the ethnic game, what that was brought to the city, it begins to change as they come together with other groups. And of course, the dads who are coaches, they also have to change. And so I think it's very much the process, the immigration story of becoming Chicagoans more than it was, we're from here, we're from here, we're from here. And soccer created this idea of Chicago. I think Sermak, the mayor, picked up on this and, and made political hay out of it much quicker than anybody else. Um, so that, that begins to approach what you said, Dave. You know, like in Glasgow, you had to play for Ranger, you had to play for Celtic or their affiliated clubs. And then Chicago, and I, I think probably the entire United States, you just played for the Irish club and whoever had the most money. And the Hibs were very much part of that. They said, let's move beyond being Irish Free State or Ireland. We want to be Irish Chicago. We want to have the best club out here. Um, and coincidentally, they went to Coal City a lot. And uh, there were fights and, again, guns drawn, but there was also drinking and camaraderie and betting and gambling. Uh, I didn't even really get into that uh, part of the book. Um, I found it interesting that the Irish found a lot more sociability with the mining communities than they did the English cricket clubs. <laughs> I guess that's not really that surprising. And just to follow up on that, then the relative strength of the Gaelic Athletic Association in uh, yeah. Chicago, um, were they more, was the, the Irish community in Chicago a little bit more inclined to play the association code than the Gaelic games? You know, there's, there's always so much resistance within the Republican movement to play. Yeah, that's a funny story in itself. Uh, the GAA was incredibly strong in Chicago. In fact, uh, they played a New York team in GAA's rules at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. But a lot of these players also played association football and saw this as an opportunity to. Um, but Chicago blue lawed the Irish, but not the other ethnic groups, not the English and the Scotch. And so they could meet on Sunday and they could drink on Sunday and the cops turned the other way and the legal forces turned the other way. But when the Irish went out to play other communities and other teams, um, they would be brought down on and fined. And so the Irish community said, okay, we'll have a league of our own and we'll play Gaelic football. And then on Thanksgiving, they would get together and they'd put together a soccer team and they would play the Chicago soccer stars, usually on the Gaelic grounds where they could do it unmolested. And it would, they'd usually win. And it showed, yeah, we can play this, but because we can't leave the city on Sundays, 
uh, we'll just continue playing the GAA. But when the turn of the century happened and they entered the league, they did so significantly. Thanks. Other questions? Fire away. Okay. Can I, can I if no one else does, can I, can I? I'm like Please. David, I, I will ask tons of questions. I'm sorry, Gabe. Please come. Um, but uh, I, I was curious, because you mentioned just in passing prohibition and you talk about CERMAC and, uh, and I found that part really, really interesting as well in the book. And I, I wanted to know a little bit more. You, you just highlighted the question of betting, gambling, et cetera. It's not necessarily something that you spend a lot of time talking about, but I imagine you came across all sorts of evidence about, you know, when, when you say that there were fights, there were, you know, guns drawn, all this, I imagine all of that turned around a second industry behind the game, which is, gambling, prohibition, uh, liquor trafficking, et cetera. And I was just curious if you could kind of flesh that out a little bit more, um, if, if there is anything else to flesh out more. The two main protagonists in the 1920s were the bricklayers and Sparta. And, I mean, th these games were dogfights. And there was a lot of money that was changing hands when they did play each other. And if one, I'm not surprised there were so many riots in those games because people were losing substantial amounts of money. And one way to stop having to pay somebody off was to riot and stop the game. And that would happen. It got to such a point that cops would begin showing up and circling the field to make sure that there weren't any riots. And um, Johnny Murray out of St. Louis, uh, he ran, he was able to survive the depression by running books on the St. Louis games. And those booking is a bookie that extended up to the Chicago leagues as well, especially inner city matches. And um, the, the wires, the telegraph wires had to be protected from interception of scores to keep people from being paid off. Um, and the Irish and Cole City, again, to get back to what Dave said, uh, those were notorious for the gambling and people offering money for the winners of these games on the cups. Um, so it's, it's not, there's obviously not a lot of documentation on there. It's more in the police reports, uh, some of the police reports that I found where uh, those were brought to light. <laughs> That's never changed. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Hey, one thing I wanted to uh, kind of I, I kind of tease a little bit about this in the group chat here, but um, you know, I, it, it, from a New York perspective, right? And uh, you know, I'm kind of a fanboy for Bob Millar. So that uh, 1928 Open Cup, um, mm -hmm. I get a real kick out of your description, of, your description of the tie. I mean, from a New York soccer perspective, the bricklayers played like you know, bricklayers. Uh, uh, you know, in other words, it was a very rough, rough physical team, and you would. You do kind of acknowledge that, but you, it seems like you almost, uh, and again, I just kind of enjoy that in the book where you almost start to adopt a partisan perspective and that you, oh, yeah. you and, and um, I wondered if you could just kind of connect that kind of personal voice that seems to me that I really find it in that passage. Um, you know, when I think of you and your history in terms of soccer, um, I think of you in the Tulsa Roughnecks. Um, and so, you know, you touch on the sting a little bit later on. Um, what drew you to this particular project on Chicago sport? Was it initially the, the, the communist element of it that you just found out about that and that kind of pulled you into the whole thing? Or, you know, what, what drew you to the Windy City in terms of this whole project? Yeah, um, well, I, I was a player and uh, by the 1990s, I'd relocated to Chicago and uh, I was kicking in the Chicago leagues. And I was starting my doctoral work and I couldn't find a subject that was turning me on. And sport history was not wide known. It certainly wasn't taught at the school. And I remember proposing to people, well, what if I looked at Chicago soccer as, a, as an athletic element of looking at labor and immigration? And no one would bite. And so I kind of struggled on looking at, I think, some militia roles from Vermont in the Revolutionary War and was about to drop out. And uh, I got a hold of this advisor and he said, no, this is fantastic. 
And uh, so I took it and ran with it. And I was interviewing a few of these last remaining old bricklayers. And of course, I was always involved with the unions. And it, it just caught my attention. And he began, the way they would describe these games is so rough and tumble. And what the brickies had to offer, uh, you're right, it was partisan. I began to relate to them, to their, their union membership and being uh, so far apart from paternalistic organizations. And then to make it all the way up to that level. And then here comes New York, which was, was as you point out, as fine a team as, as ever graced the 1920s soccer landscape. And they come to Chicago, and it's this more St. Louis style, Midwest style, where it could easily be brought out to an American football field as well as a soccer field. And the New York team was graceful and, and skilled. And well, we can't beat that, so let's just knock the hell out of them. And it, it was that. It was a it was a brutal brutal match. I think the bricklayers finished with eight players. So quite clearly, the New York team was able to give that side out just as well as receive it. <laughs> but that yeah, that there was the affinity, Dave. Good read, good eyes. <laughs> uh, okay. Kevin, you've got a, a great note here. Do you want to just uh, touch on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, David. Um, just a, a word on, on your sources, Gabe. It was fabulous to see all the, the variety of stuff that you used, especially the, the, you know, the, the source of scrapbooks and things that came from ethnic communities, the Swedish ones, the mining stuff. And it just seems to me, um, I mean, I remember, you know, Len, Len Oliver wrote this article back in 86 that was, sent, you know, basically saying there is such an amazing, rich, um, uh, you know, social history about the working class, about ethnic groups that we all kind of know on the surface level, like the big grand narrative is there, but you know, none of the stories have really been told at the, at the, the, you know, city local group level. And you're, you're, and you've done a city history, which is phenomenal and it's so detailed. And, um, so I, I'm, I mean, part of it is to, to applaud the sources. I think that's really fa fascinating. And I'd love to see more material come out of those types of organizations because, you know, places like Western Pennsylvania, which had such a strong yeah. mining and soccer tradition, um, you know, one, you know, we need to get out there and to see what still exists, if, if anything, um, is left over. And kind of linked to that, I didn't put it in the comment, but I was also thinking about something else that that seems to be underexploited in this uh, in that time period that you've looked at, which is the foreign language press. Um, and the Library of Congress has you know digitized up to like two hundred, there's some two hundred foreign newspapers that are in chronicling America, and uh, that I have never yet spent any time looking through. And also, I don't even know if there's a way to translate some of that stuff because I you know the the most of them are German. And I don't. I sadly don't read German. But um, but I wonder if that's something that you looked at at all. I mean, it, you don't really mention that. But is that is that? Do you see? What do you? What? How do you engage with that kind of stuff? How can we? How can we as a you know historically interested community engage with those types of sources? Yeah, but I'll start with the foreign language press. So a lot of these people, these scholars, were unemployed during the Great Depression, and uh, the Works Project one of the jobs was to translate these newspapers. And so Chicago has a, a pretty good section of translated sports sections from the foreign language press. Um, but nationally, I, I think those are still waiting their translators. And I think you're right. There's got to be some gems in there because oftentimes these uh, soccer clubs were the glue of the community and they were allowing for the Americanization, for lack of a better word, process to take place in the cities. Um, it, it's, I, I don't know, I, it's, it's so hit and miss on what sources are still there. Uh, I, I've come to the point now that it's almost impossible for me not to find the remnants of some soccer club anywhere in the United States in this period. They were there. I found a vibrant league up here in the Upper Peninsula for crying out loud. Uh, through these old newspapers, but it's just a, it's an overlooked and forgotten history. Um, if I can, one more thing about that, Kevin, I think Pennsylvania, I, I think it was as hard-nosed and American players as any in the United States. 
that that story while there's been a lot done on it there's a lot more to be done on it yeah i, I think that just to follow up on that even in terms of penn west right some of those some of those um kind of like a power centers in some ways kind of carry on and there's some really interesting tensions with um relatively newer by newer i mean like you know 20 to 30 year old soccer entities that are still kind of negotiating that space so there's a lot going on in in western pa and look you got you know coach kowalski still there in pittsburgh you know um so then there's some great you know paul child john kowalski are great resources uh in that in terms of that whole western pa scene um just in terms of people that i you know communicate with regularly about that my wife is from pittsburgh so this is a pretty oh, well, there, uh, yeah. special thing yeah you know, think to me some of those great teams in pittsburgh and the way in which the national team selection process would try to negotiate east and west is another really kind of interesting tale walter barr would talk about it a little bit uh back in the day when when he, you know, again these these resources are starting to slip away from us and and again that to me is the really great 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 thing about uh this book um is that it provides a template for um, regional studies, um, city studies, um, even the way in which you negotiate, you know, you, you talk about negotiating the sporting space, uh, but the way in which you negotiate um, urban to suburban to even rural communities and entities having to shift those and, you know, what governing body is responsible here, what governing body is responsible here, who do they interface with, um, how do they mutate um, with, you know, certain you know, the diffusion of different communities as immigration patterns happen. Um, it's all there in this book. Um, like I said, really kind of providing a template for people in other spaces around the country to say, hey, these are the kind of sources. And again, Kevin, to your point with these foreign language papers, I know in terms of my own work, I, I know that I need to be doing more of that. And one tip that I would just say, even if you can't read in those languages, you know, with your search uh, keywords, try different variations um, of spellings of the words that would be there too, because there's, you know, even the, you know, what, what word you're using to describe the game. Sometimes you can get uh, catches on things and then, you know, you can kind of build from the nouns in all honesty and then work out the, the, the verbs from there. Right. Um, just into, you know, we need to be looking at that and then just draw upon the community of scholars here and the, the linguistic abilities. I think you're probably the most, uh, um, multilingual of, of all of us, Kevin, right? So, but I mean, like, if we could all draw upon our own resources in that regard, right? If, if you think, okay, this article has really got something, um, we can hopefully network amongst one another to, to, to try to figure out exactly what is at stake in a particular um, article that we come across. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we've got about two minutes left before we hit 90 minutes. Um, so does anybody have one more question before the whistle blows thrice? Okay, no overtime. That's good. I need a beer. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's great. We'll keep it in keep it in regulation time. Uh, no Fergie time or Oli time, I guess, as you have to say nowadays. Um, so Gabe, thank you so much uh, thank for you. sharing this. Thank you, Drew. Uh, you thank Gabe, you for having me. Really great photographic tour through that uh, rich history of soccer in Chicago. Um, thank you everyone who joined this call. Thank you everyone who will watch this in the future. Uh, once we get the recording up, uh, this, I think, provides a great um, artifact uh, for other scholars to draw from. Hopefully draw people to your book, which I just think the world of. I, I um, don't make any money off that book. It's an academic book. So I, I think I got a royalty. I, I keep scholars. hoping for commission on this, Gabe. You can have uh, three of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's just such a fantastic project. Um, I think uh, it's really exciting for those who want to know more about Chicago soccer, but if you want to, you know, kind of a, a model for how to engage on soccer in soccer uh, research in your own communities, it really provides that pathway. So, Gabe, thank you so much. This has really been fun. Thank you, everybody who's been on this. And, thank you, uh, everybody. Tom, do you want to say anything about uh, future SASH sessions? Yeah. Yes, I will say that we're in the uh, planning uh, stages for uh, doing club history. We're going to have uh, three historians from across the 20th century uh, who do uh, a club's history. And 
I believe two of the three were on today's call. So uh, we'll, we'll create that little suspense for you. We'll announce that. And uh, Kevin and I will be co-moderating. And we look for just, you know, kind of how Gabe has shown uh, to do, you know, a, a local history, a city's history. We're going to drill down even further. And, and these experts will share uh, how they do it in a particular club setting with the sources that have been given to them or the sources that they don't have and that, what they have to do to, to create um, the story of a club. So uh, really looking forward to that. And I think that could be part one of a series because there are, are other people doing, uh, you know, club histories, you know, across the spectrum, across the, the timeline as well. But certainly, Gabe, thank you very much. Uh, my first uh, Friday session from uh, England. So uh, I think the tech worked out for me and uh, happy to see everybody again. Be well. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, Gabe. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Cheers, y'all. Cheers.